Welcome back to The World Today and its politics in Europe, especially in Croatia, specifically where locals are voting in parliamentary elections. More than 2,000 candidates are contesting in the general elections, which is widely seen as a popularity test between the Croatian Democratic Union's incumbent Prime Minister Andrei Plenković and the country's President Zoran Milanovic. Amid a series of corruption scandals and high inflation, support for the Croatian Democratic Union has slowly eroded since it first, it first took power following the country's independence in 1991. Blankovic and his ruling HDZ party looked certain to secure a third term in office until last month when President Milanovic announced he would run for prime minister. According to exit polls, HDZ is set to win the election will fall short of achieving an outright majority, with 58 seats in the 151-seat parliament. Meanwhile, the Social Democrats' party is on course to win 66 seats, while Homeland Movement is a distant third with 13. The Prince of Wales has returned to public duties for the first time since his wife, Prince, Princess Catherine, revealed her cancer diagnosis. He visited a food distribution charity in Surrey, surplus to supper, before arriving at a nearby youth centre in West London. Prince William donned a pinny to help make Bolognese sauce and was given Get Well Soon cards by well-wishers. Last month, the Princess of Wales revealed she was in the early stages of preventive chemotherapy. Prince William's previous official engagement was on March 19th in Sheffield, three days before his wife's announcement. A mother nature continues to threaten lives across the world. More than 11,000 people have now been told to evacuate their homes in Indonesia to a safe place following multiple eruptions of a remote island volcano. Air travels in the region has also been disrupted, raising fears the volcano could collapse into the sea and trigger a tsunami, as it did during a previous eruption in 1871. Mount Ruang erupted at least five times since Tuesday, billowing clouds of smoke and ash into the sky. Indonesia's volcanology raised the alert to high levels, warning people not to go within six kilometers of the peak. It's been a difficult few days for people in the United Arab Emirates, which received a year's worth of rainfall in just 24 hours on Tuesday. Operations at the Dubai International Airport, which were severely disrupted, are slowly resuming. A storm flooded roads and sections of the busy international airport. 20 people were reportedly killed, one in Oman, another in the UAE. Some inbound flights have resumed today. But on the whole, Dubai International Airport is struggling to function. Authorities at the world's second busiest airport said today they had started receiving inbound flights at Terminal 1, used by foreign carriers, but that outbound fl flights continue to be delayed. They later announced that check-in was open at Terminal 3 for Emirates, the single largest carrier at the airport, and Fly Dubai flights. But they warned a larger number of travellers were waiting to check in and long delays are expected. It's been no better for those in Abu Dhabi. Uh, this video we're about to show you is from the Yas Island, where heavy rain and lightning battered the commercial district of the UAE capital. You see locals running for shelter. A sparkful winds and bent nearby trees. Police advised motorists to exercise caution and follow speed limits displayed on electronic information boards. Speed limits have been reduced to 100 kilometers per hour on the roads, including on the Abu Dhabi Al Ain Highway. A UAE's Center of Meteorology warned of the adverse weather conditions may continue through Wednesday, forecasting another wave of thunderstorms caused by connective clouds over coastal areas. Wind speeds could reach up to 70 kilometers per hour, with heavy rainfall expected across the country. Uh, those are pictures from Dubai and not Abu Dhabi. We apologize. But here in Africa, though, heavy rains and flooding is wreaking havoc across the east, claiming lives and displacing thousands of people in Kenya and in Tanzania. In Kakola Ombaka in Kenya, officials report 646 households have been displaced with hundreds of people seeking refuge in evacuation centers or with relatives on higher ground. 
The situation is dire across the region, with Kenya reporting at least 13 fatalities from flooding, while Tanzania has recorded 58 deaths in the past two weeks alone. Authorities are urging residents in flood-prone areas to relocate to, as the rains persist, the Kenyan Meteorological Department issued warnings about the impending heavy rainfall, urging preparedness for potential floods. As the region braces for further rainfall, the plight of those affected by the floods underscores the urgent need for coordinated disaster response efforts to mitigate the impact of vulnerable communities. Well, scientists have been explaining away the deadly heat wave here in West Africa and the Sahel, putting the blame on human activity. The temperatures have surged about 48 degrees Celsius in Mali last month, with one hospital linking hundreds of deaths to the extreme heat. Researchers say human activities like burning fossil fuels have made temperatures go up 1.4 degrees Celsius hotter than normal. A separate study on drought in southern Africa said El Nino was to blame rather than climate change. Away from weather events now, Burkina Faso has expelled three French diplomats for engaging in what it says is submersive activities. The diplomats, who include two political advisors at the French embassy in Ouagadougou, have been asked to leave the territory of Burkina Faso within the next 48 hours. That notice, issued by the Burkina Bay Foreign Affairs Ministry, dated April 16, did not reveal the nature of the diplomats' activities. Relations between Burkina Faso and its former colonial power, France, have gone south since Captain Ibrahim Traoré seized power in a coup in September 2022, while the junta is more open to Russian powers. In the Central African Republic, Country and France have agreed on a roadmap to boost bilateral cooperation as both countries strive to revive strained ties. It follows a meeting in Paris on Wednesday between CAR President Faustine Assange Touadoura and French President Emmanuel Macron. President Touadoura's visit to France, a second in over six months, signals growing efforts by both countries to smooth the relations which were strained after the CAR government started heavily depending on military and political support from Russia. According to a joint statement from both countries, roadmap of the cooperation aims to establish the framework of a constructive partnership that respects the sovereignty of the state. In Kenya now, hundreds of doctors and other medical practitioners continue their protests demanding better pay and working conditions in an ongoing nationwide strike that has entered its fifth week. The doctors carried placards and chanted against the Kenyan government, saying it failed to implement a raft of, of promises, including a collective bargaining agreement signed in 2017 after a 100 day strike during which people died from lack of care. The strike has left many patients without access to essential medical services, exacerbating their conditions and causing distress. We are here because the government of Kenya has gone to, for a strike. We are trying to compel them to come back to the negotiation table because they had been ordered by the courts to come back to the negotiation table and conclude the CBA, which they have refused. So they have gone on strike and we are trying to tell them to come back to the table. We give notice and Vuvuzuelas and whistles are the only language we can use to speak on the streets. And we want our plight, our issues to be understood. Because when there are no doctors, there are no, when there are no healthcare workers in the hospitals, then the patients can't get care. We are Kenyans and we are, we are able to also be patient actually at one particular point. So we know when we, are, when, when, we are, when we speak of the issues of Kenyans, it's, we are, it's that we are, we are Kenyans. And therefore there is need that these taxes that we pay, be part of it must be used to actually make healthcare. So it is hypocrisy and uh, dishonesty to tell us that there is no money and come and target our salaries. Yet nobody is talking about the scale of work we do. No one is saying, no one is saying that we are going to do less work. They want us to do the same work that people did last year with 70% less pay, which we shall not sit down and watch happen. Let's bring in Kenyan journalist Cyrus Sambati. Here's in Nairobi. Cyrus, great to see you. And these doctors have already lost their jobs the last I, I heard, the last I understand. They've been replaced by government uh, government doctors, uh, doctors from the government, beg your pardon. Uh, why are they still protesting? Well, uh, thank you for having me. So, the protest is only related to the fact that uh, the pronouncement that they have been sacked. 
I mean, the problem of citing all those doctors is not uh, is, uh, such an easy exercise because uh, the doctors themselves are the ones who approve those who are supposed to be employed in a, in a French way. So, actually, even the court system they protected them from being sacked from uh, the government as, as earlier on uh, pronounced. So, they are still in service. The only thing that we are waiting for is for the, the talks which they started yesterday to be concluded. Uh, that's what we are waiting for now. But so they're not working, then they're not being paid. They're still striking. There's no assurance from the government that their demands will be met. Is there, are they holding on to some hope that we don't know about? Oh, well, actually, as I told you earlier on, the courts protected them from being served. In as much as they're not being paid for now, what we understand is that uh, they are protected and they, they hope that uh, the ongoing talks are going to bear fruit so that can be like a kind of a, have a, a return to work program kind of exercise because uh, they hope that there will be a, an agreement at the end for them to come back to work with a better pay with their the money now. And what has the health system been like in Kenya since these strikes started? Well, it's, it's in shambles, in the chaotic, because all public hospitals are affected. And then uh, this week, uh, the private hospitals are, are actually present to join the strike, but they have not yet done that. And the mortuaries are also, the morticians are also present to join the strike. So you can imagine what it takes, because most Kenyans are relying on the public hospitals to, to, to get the services. And now it's in chaotic, so if you fall sick, if you are involved in an accident, you go to the one and it's attending to you. Maybe the nurses, if you are there, they are the ones who can attend to you, but Things are not good here. Yeah, things are thick. But I think that's the least I can tell you. Things are not good. So what options are open to Kenyans who have to use health services, who still have to go to hospitals uh, for treatments and, uh, and all of that? There are no options they have because they have to go to public hospitals. They want to be available. Because public hospitals are all over the country. The private hospitals are fair. With a few here, they are, they are expensive to kind of uh, go for services. And uh, not, not, not most of Kenyans can afford that. But what we are learning is that most people are dying at home, and uh, the motorists are reporting a higher number of people who are dying being infected with the motorists. So that shows you that uh, the, the, effect, the, effect or the impact of this strike is so huge and massive on Kenyans at large. Cyrus, who bears the responsibility for these deaths? The fact that people are home, they have no access to health care, the doctors are on strike. Who takes responsibility for their deaths? Well, it depends on where you are sitting, where you are talking from, because uh, the doctors had actually issued a strike notice before they went on strike. They said that uh, the government had uh, stopped paying their, their, their dues. So they issued a strike notice demanding that the government come on board for talks. When they, they, they noticed the lapse, they went on strike. So the, the government is saying, we don't have that money to pay you. I mean, uh, who, who do you blame here? The doctors are saying, we are demanding our services to be kind of made better. And the, the government saying that we don't have money to pay you. Uh, to me, I would say the government should bear the responsibility because uh, it's the one which signed this uh, CBA and they're trying to kind of uh, jump the gun, saying we can't afford this uh, CBA for now. So apart from striking, what else are the doctors doing in the meantime? How are they able to sustain themselves? Well, some of these doctors, are, they, they, they work privately. They are doing services in uh, private hospitals. So that's how they are sustaining themselves. Those who can't afford to, uh, those who are not employed in private hospitals, and I, they are relying on the, what they are saving they had had. So they just, uh, just a wait and see. It's uh, an issue of, uh, we don't know when it's going to end. And as much as the court says, they have uh, 30 days to solve the matter and to go back to work. Wow. Uh, being good health, Cyrus, that's our prayer for you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Thank you so much for me. Sure. We're off on another break now of the world today. Still ahead. The late Princess Diana's classy and timeless fashion is exhibited in an auction in Hong Kong. Stay with us. Our tour of Africa continues in Tunisia, where President Kai Saied has met with Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney to discuss the issue of illegal immigration and economic cooperation. During the meeting in Tunis, Mrs. Saied reiterated Tunisia's refusal to be a destination or transit point for illegal immigrants, calling for a joint approach to addressing the problem. 
For her part, the Italian Prime Minister thanked Tunisia's efforts in fighting human trafficking and stressed the need for cooperation to address the matter. Both sides signed three agreements after the meeting, in which Italy agreed to provide support for Tunisia's energy projects, its small and medium-sized businesses, as well as an agreement on higher education and scientific research cooperation. Ms. Maloney's visit to Tunisia is the fourth in less than a year, and the first following the announcement of Italy's Matei plan, which aims at boosting development in Africa, hoping it will help spark economic growth, which will curb irregular immigration to Europe. Over in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, is currently on an official visit to discuss human rights and to voice support for the country and its people. Speaking on his first full day in the DRC, he highlights how the country is one of the richest in natural resources, but these riches have brought little benefit to the population as a whole because of violence and conflicts. Mr. Turk's mission continues. He is due to meet President Felix Shisekedi and senior members of the government. Also in Kishasa, he'll be meeting civil society representatives, the National Human Rights Commission, members of political parties and the diplomatic community. Met with a group of people who had been displaced as a result of horrible violence. Massacres were committed in their homes, and they have been here for the last four years. Their most fervent wish is to go, be able to go back. The first Russian-African International Conference on Combating Infectious Diseases is underway in Kampala, the Ugandan capital. The conference brings together leading experts from 16 countries, as well as from the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Regional Bureau of the World Health Organization for African Countries. It's the first of its kind, the first joint African-Russian international conference on combating infectious diseases. Conference participants are discussing the latest advances in the treatment and prevention of infectious diseases, modern threats and challenges to biological safety, as well as exchange experiences and develop joint strategies. Infection disease, uh, I think, is uh, the cooperation type, a partnership type for the Africa to combine the lot of GDs. Like from Guinea, we have a lot of experience with Russian cooperation about the infection disease to help Guinean health public to combat the, the lot of disease. In the Russian delegation is led by head of the Russian Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Wellbeing, Anna Popova, who laments the non-existence of data on infectious diseases in many countries, adding that a number of factors are threatening global biological security. Data on the infectious disease status of many countries is unreliable or non-existent. More than half of infections are not diagnosed. Monitoring and analyzing biological risks shows that threats to biological security are growing and life proves this to be the case. The global epidemiological situation is unstable, with outbreaks of dangerous Ebola and Marburg virus intensifying and spreading to new territories, including in Africa. Historically, there is significant risk to the country for public health threats with back-to-back -back disease outbreaks of zoonotic and vector-borne nature and other emergencies that impact on the socio-economical and livelihood of its population. This makes its health system to be continuously challenged by multiple public health emergencies. However, continuous efforts are taken to maintain and enhance the capacity needed to prepare and respond to all types of public health threats. And that is a great appreciation and an opportunity to Uganda in these areas. I think in African country, where I, in African country, specifically in Niger, the challenges are, firstly, the imbalance of the national distribution. 
Secondly, you have the inadequacy of uh, the laboratory system uh, and their efficacy for, uh, to, to prevent uh, weaponization. And uh, also the training, you have to, this training is very important. How can we combat these challenges? Okay, to combat these challenges, uh, to, uh, to develop more cooperation, yeah, and uh, to, to develop funded um, national, uh, international or regional uh, uh, to, to combat this uh, challenge. The Russian African International Conference on Combating Infectious Diseases began on Wednesday and will end on Friday, April 19th. 170 delegates from 16 countries, including Uganda, Burundi, Burkina Faso, Vietnam, Gabon, Guinea, Egypt, Zambia, Mozambique, Namibia, Niger, Congo, Ethiopia, are discussing the prevention and treatment of diseases and sharing experiences in countering dangerous outbreaks, new disease surveillance techniques, and scientific research. Four former senior Malawi officials have been banned from entering the U.S. over corruption allegations. They include former police chief George Kainja, former head of the Malawi Anti-Corruption Bureau, Reinek Matemba, former director of public procurement and disposal of assets, John Suzy Banda, and former police service attorney, Mwabi Kaluba. The four have been designated by the State Department as generally ineligible for entry into the United States due to their involvement in significant corruption. The ban also extends to the spouses of the ex-officials. The statement adds that the banned officials abused their public positions by accepting bribes and other articles of value from a private business person in exchange for awarding a government procurement contract for the Malawi Police Service. The former officials are also facing charges in Malawi after they were named on a list of more than 80 prominent Malawians accused by the anti graft body of having corruption dealings with a British businessman, Zunet Sitar. All four and Mrs. Sitar deny any wrongdoing. Remembering Princess Diana in Hong Kong, that's where an auction house launched an exhibition featuring her classy and timeless fashion looks at the K11 Museum. At the exhibition, you can see several designer gowns and dresses worn by the late British princess, as well as the colorful handbags and hats and shoes she wore to public events. A 1986 Murray Abbey Midnight Blue Tulle strap strapless gown is among the center pieces of the exhibition. Diana wore this gown at the Phantom of the Opera musical premiere in October 1986. Co-founder and executive director of Julian's Auctions, Martin Nolan, said most of the items at the auction have never been exhibited before, including a yellow and navy two-piece suit Catherine Walker designed for Diana. The ex exhibition will remain in Hong Kong until April 29th, if you wish to stop by, before moving on to New York and London for its world tour. The auction for the exhibited pieces will be held on June 27th in Ireland at the Museum of Style Icons and Online. This is very special because we have amazing person items, shoes, bags, hats that we've never seen come to auction before for Princess Diana. I think this beautiful outfit designed by Captain Walker, this beautiful two-piece suit, the yellow jacket with navy trim and the navy skirt, designed by Captain Walker, Diana's friend. This is an incredible collection celebrating the life and career and legacy of Princess Diana, her elegance, 
And we're here in Hong Kong. It's a world tour, but this is a world exclusive. So Hong Kong gets to see these items for the very first time, including items that Diana herself wore when she came to visit Hong Kong in 1989. So this is a very special collection. We're here at K11 Museum until April 29th. And then we go to New York and London, and the auction will take place in Ireland at the Museum of Star Icons on June 27th and online at juliansauctions.com. And that's the world today. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi. Bye.